and that's happening at the moment. Okay, so welcome everybody. And Michelle, thank you for organizing this, pulling it together. Really appreciate it. Um, hopefully for you guys, you'll be able to use this. And I said to Michelle uh, when we sort of chatted a couple of weeks ago about it, um, I don't have any of this recorded. I normally just, I have it all recorded in my heart, like all of us. We have stuff recorded in our hearts and in our brains, but nothing on technology. So we're recording this, and I want to encourage you to feel free to go ahead and use whatever content uh, content is applicable to you, applies to you, and is helpful to you. Go ahead and use it. Um, there's no copyright on this. And I do have a presentation that I will be, it's a keynote presentation. I can submit it and I can upload it into uh, PowerPoint and Mac Keynote formats. And I can even make PDFs of it. So I can upload those, give them to Michelle. Um, we can have those accessible as well. Again, there's no copyright for any of, the, of this information. We just want to get it out there and help people on their journey of health and their journey of intimacy with Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> it's an oils in the Bible class. Uh, Daphne and I have been, um, if you're not on, on this call, like if you just kind of, what is oils in the Bible <clears throat> and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, you will very quickly get the idea that I do, and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, in fact, I believe it's a, uh, it's a very powerful dynamic with regard to the season in history that we're in at the moment. Very, very exciting. And uh, you'll hear a lot, lot about that. And if you have any questions about that afterwards, um, there's many of us who can help. And I'm more than willing to chat with you about that as well. But yes, it's an oils in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you things. Well, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything new. So on one hand, I'm, think, I'm sort of thinking to myself, why are they even coming on? Because they've all got Google, I think. They must have all got Google. And they must all have Bibles. And they must all have a, a, the ability to read. So. All of this information you've probably heard before, but you may not have heard it in the format that I'm putting it together. Um, and with maybe some of the revelations that I, and the excitement that I have about essential oils. Daphne and I have been involved um, with essential oils for five or six years. In fact, more than that, uh, quite a long time now, but specifically with doTERRA for five or six years. Um, started the journey of natural health, but I never really I was never against it, but I'm a guy, okay? I don't see any other guys on, this, on, the, on the, the call here because we're just a little bit slow, all right? We're like, whatever, I don't need a doctor. I don't need to address my health unless I'm nearly dead. And that's typically the guy's mentality. Um, so it's not surprising to me that there's not a whole bunch of guys on the call, but the reality is that we do catch up. And I caught up a little bit after Daphne did when I had my own experience with essential oils. Now, being in the, in the pastoral ministry for, for many years, I mean, I kind of grew up in the church, had a relationship with God since I, with Jesus, since I was six. And that was really the foundation of um, life. But it wasn't, it, it didn't really, my relationship with Jesus didn't shape my life as much as my life experiences did. So I went through, um, and I, I'll hopefully I'll qualify all of that. Um, I went through, much of my life knowing who Jesus was, but really he didn't, I, I didn't have the ability at the time, I'm trying to pick my words right, I didn't have the ability, I didn't know how to allow that knowledge and that experience, that revelation of Jesus to transform my life, change my life so that my life could be directed by him, if that makes sense. So we all go through life, we all have experiences. Um, I wanted to know God more. I was involved in the church. I got heavily involved in the church from a young age because of my relationship with Jesus, because I really did want to know him more. I had been through some abuse as a child and uh, it happened on a few occasions and it really created a lot of damage and trauma in my life. And from those experiences, I began to live out of life. But from those experiences too, that became the tension of I read in the Bible about Jesus and about how good he's supposed to be and about how good God is supposed to be. But my life experiences um, showed me something very different. And so went on this journey of life, trying to discover everything. Um, got heavily involved in the church because as far as I was able and aware at the time, that was the next part of the journey to be able to um, 
experience God or to become closer to him. And I think we all understand that journey. We go to church. We want to be closer with God. We want to have this relationship, which is life changing, which heals us from the traumas and the experiences that we've been through in life. And very often, um, for me anyway, that was the motivation and that was the drive. I really wanted to know this God of the Bible who talks about healing. And he talks about restoration and wholeness because my life was not um, experiencing that internally. Now, externally, uh, things looked really good. Daff and I had kids, had a good job. Um, But internally, my life was falling apart and was really tough because of the feelings of shame, because of the abuse. It was sexual abuse. The feelings of failure because I was never good academically. Um, very good with my hands in, in woodwork and metalwork. I could, I could build anything and see anything and do anything. I was really, really good. And I still am good in that way. But academically, I was very poor. And so all of these things, and I, I know many of you recognize and are able to identify with the journey of, of a heart struggle, emotional struggle. And so I'd been on this journey all of my life, went to Bible school because I was pursuing um, God. And I I really wanted to know him for who he is, who he was, and who he said he was in the Bible. So this is very, very, um, a very quick overview of my journey to be to experience essential oils and what essential oils have done for me. So got to Bible school in Dallas, Texas. Um, We spent two years there. I think it was the, the About 18 months after being at Bible school, I remember I used to run every morning and get a wake up four o'clock in the morning and go for a run and spend time with with God. And there was one morning that I got completely frustrated with him. And I was still carrying this pain in my heart. I was still carrying this guilt. Now, nobody at Bible school, Daphne didn't even know what I'd been through as a child. She didn't even know the abuse that I'd been through because it was hidden. And the shame and the guilt and all of these things were hidden, the failure feelings of failure and insufficiency. So about 18 months into being in Bible school, this was 90, uh, 1998, I, um, I just stopped on the, on the track when I was running and I just shouted at God. And I said, God, you know, I've had it. I've done it. I've, I've worked enough. I've done enough. Um, I've performed enough. I've, I've led worship enough. I've preached enough. I've done all of the things that, that Christianity expects us to do and wants us to do. But yet my heart was still in this place of torment. My heart was still broken. I was still um, suffering from all of these emotional struggles. So I, I, said, that, I said to God that day, I shouted at him. Um, people around in the neighborhood must have thought, Somebody outside was loony, and and I probably was at the time. I probably still am a little bit. But the reality is I I laid down my tools, and I said, I'm not doing anything anymore. I stopped reading my Bible. I I gave up on the works of my Christianity, but I never gave up on Jesus. I never gave up on God, and I never gave up on what what I knew, who I knew the Holy Spirit was by name, but not by person. I never gave up on, on my relationship with God. I just gave up on the works um, of trying to accomplish, um, accomplish Christianity to bring a healed heart. Fast forward, um, six months later, Daph and I, I decided we, we were done at Bible school after two years, uh, went back to South Africa and within three months of being back in South Africa, we had an email from a church in Toronto and they said, we hear that you guys are available in South Africa. You're not doing anything. Um, and we'd like to invite you to come and be children's pastors in our church in Toronto. And it was just an amazing journey. It's like an emotion for some crazy reason. Um, it's an amazing journey of God's goodness, how he takes us in our place of, of, of um, I won't even call it desperation. I'll call it a place of being real. When our hearts are truly open to him and real with him and say, God, this is just who I am. I'm a mess. I get it. I, I understand I'm a mess. I understand grace. I know that I just want to know you. And I just want to know how beautiful you are so I can be healed. Um, And he takes us from that place where I gave up my pursuit of works. And um, he went back to South Africa. And then within three months, we ended up in Canada. Um, As children's pastors of a church that just blew our minds, like how the heck did this ever happen? And, And, but that began the journey of two, two things in my life. One, was the revelation of God as my father. I'm going to come back to this as I talk about essential oils, that God is my dad. He truly is. He's, he's not 
um, a God, and I'm, I, I, I'll be careful by saying this because I don't want to take it out of context, but he's, he's, he doesn't want actually, first and foremost, he doesn't want me to worship him. He wants me to be intimate with him and love him. Very clearly spoken out by, by the demonstration of, of creation and the demonstration of Jesus Christ himself. Um, he wants me to be intimate with him. And so he's my dad. He's my, my father who created me in his image and his likeness. And how beautifully he, he loves me and wants me to be intimate with him, to have this relationship with him, to hear his voice, to speak with him, to be able to, in the spirit, to wrap my arms around him and hug him and be hugged and be loved. He wants that because that's what a dad wants. And um, Jesus demonstrated that very well. And the, that, so the, the, the journey of discovering God as my father, as a loving, kind father, was what, what began to happen in Toronto when we became pastors there. Again, this began to bring the healing to the place of brokenness in my heart. Um, and this is what it requires, the father's love. I had a beautiful dad. I still have a very, very honor to have an amazing dad. Um, but to know God as a perfect father, unconditionally accepting, even in my brokenness, was so beautiful and so healing. And this is what he knew I needed. I just didn't know where to find it. And so he took us to Toronto. Um, and that was the first thing that he, he started revealing and started bringing incredible healing into my heart. And the second thing was intimacy with Holy Spirit. Now, we were at a church which um, had an amazing encounter, an amazing uh, download of Holy Spirit in 1994. And... Uh, Millions of people all over the world were brought to the place to experience the presence of Holy Spirit. And it took a journey for me as a guy, again, told you us guys are a little bit slow in things, to, to really allow my heart to be opened to the person of the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wanted, because I wanted to be in control. I wanted to maintain my, my theologies, my control. But intimacy with the Holy Spirit is the second thing that began to happen in Toronto. And um, as I started going on the journey of learning to be intimate with the Holy Spirit, um, I learned how to hear his voice. I learned how to hear the voice of God. So I could sit back and I could say, I could talk to my father. Jesus very clearly said, you're no longer going to talk to me. You're going to talk to my father in my name, but you will talk to my father. You will talk to your father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so as I learned to develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit, this was exactly the longing and the desire of the woman's heart, the Samaritan woman at the well. This was the longing of her heart to know intimately God himself. She was looking for intimacy. She's been looking for intimacy through five husbands and the, and the man she's then currently living with. And Jesus knows this. He sees this as you're looking for intimacy. And he directs her to the place of intimacy. And he says, right now, is the moment we we're having intimacy. Her and Jesus were standing. She was standing, listening, feeling, experiencing, looking at the heart of the Father. And she was having that intimacy. She was drawn into him. And this is the stuff that the Holy Spirit does. He's a real, incredible um, being, person to bring healing into our lives. I promise this is essential oils in the Bible, okay? I promise it is. And... Uh, so this was the second incredible thing that began to revolutionize my life. And I began, I, I started mission work back in Zimbabwe where in 2009, where um, I was born and raised. So I am Zimbabwean and uh, went back in 2009 to help them with the water crisis that they had there and set up some water filter factories. And we've been doing some work there ever since. But it was in 2009 where I began to experience the father's heart for the nations and for um, practically getting out and seeing people's lives changed. And I uh, was ready to leave Toronto um, and, and leave with the family. But by 2013, the whole family was ready to leave Toronto and explore what God was doing next. So we came to Calgary, and that's how we came to Calgary. Um, uh, we came and planted a church, an adult church, from kids' ministry to adult church. And I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. I'd, I'd recommend you run as fast as you can away from pastoring adult church because it's really tough okay <laughs> adults are tough kids are kids are a blast um but they're really it was it was if god's calling you he's calling you don't don't deny that but uh it was really a journey that i began to um really explore in my own heart this new territory now really experiencing um knowing god as my father experiencing the holy spirit and a revelation of Jesus came about five years ago that I've never had before that has been so life transforming. And I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to say is when we came to Toronto, 
um, in uh, to Calgary in 2013. It wasn't long after that that a really really good friend of ours in in Toronto con contacted Daphne and said, "Hey, um, I'm involved with DoTerra. This is really just in a nutshell." And some of you have heard this story. Um, essential oils. We had been using essential oils before. We had been introduced to them. But the business side of it with doTERRA was not something that we'd ever thought we'd do um, or, or even consider. It took a bit of a journey um, for us to negotiate how we could do this and pastor a church at the same time. But through the process, and I'm just uh, quickly in a nutshell, through the process, God led us out of pastoring a church and into full-time doTERRA essential oils. Now, I remember he didn't lead us out of ministry because that's where my heart is. But what he's led us out of is pastoring the local church and full-time into doTERRA and a few other things that we're doing. But, but this is where I'm going to do the transition. My experience came and my conviction came where the Holy Spirit had done a lot of healing in my heart. Um, I, I love who I am now. I don't have any shame, any guilt, any condemnation of, of any of the things that I've been through. I, I love who I am um, and I love my strengths and my weaknesses I don't really care about. But um, he had taken me through that emotional, spiritual journey, and I'm in a beautiful place in that regard, but I still needed physical healing. And, and many of us in church have said, you know, God, we want to pray for healing. Now, how many of you, just answer the question for yourself, how many of you have prayed for God to heal you from something and you haven't been healed of it? Well, that's me on a number of different fronts, but particularly um, with regard to my back, which had been um, damaged through rugby and skydiving and motorcycle racing and all the other things that we, we do. Um, so I'd had my injuries. Uh, I would probably do them all over again, just so you know. Um, us guys are not the wisest. We, we, we want to do those things. Uh, and it, it was about 2015. Um, it was, I had given up at that, at that time, uh, moving to Calgary, I'd given up running, I'd given up doing any forms of exercise because my back was in so much pain and I just couldn't, I, I couldn't, um, handle the, the tension, the pain, the, the pain and the stress that came along with, with doing exercise. And I tried everything. I tried uh, frankincense, I tried deep blue, I tried all the, the essential oils that I knew at the time and nothing had made any difference. Um, I didn't want to take any chemical drugs to, to reduce the pain. I knew that much, I didn't want to do that. I'd been to chiropractors, been to doctors, and the only final alternative that, that we had was, was surgery, but the doctors didn't want to do any surgery because of the nature of the injury and it could cause more damage or long-term negative effects, side effects. So I was pretty much left with the issue of back pain um, I didn't know really what to do. 2017, 2016 went down to um, doTERRA convention and they unveiled Copaiba. Um, and everybody was very, very excited about Copaiba essential oil. So I'm like, hey, I got nothing left to lose. I've tried everything. I'm just going to try Copaiba. So from that time forward, I started using Copaiba topically and aromatic, uh, topically and, and internally. Um, and about three weeks later, I, I um, experienced a probably about a 35% reduction in my pain level. And I'm like, this is fantastic. Nothing's ever done this before. Uh, continued using it, very excited about it. Six to eight weeks later, I had enough uh, re a reduction in pain that I could go back to gym. And I've never looked back. The only thing that ever helped me was an essential oil. Um, the only thing that ever took away the pain was Copaiba essential oil. I swear by it, I absolutely love it. Um, and it's definitely something that I have as a, as a maintenance process um, all the time on me. It doesn't matter what other essential oils there are, Copaiba is something that I have all the time. So my, my introduction into essential oils became my conviction, all right? This is, this is not just snake oil, this is not just, um, uh, something else that somebody's going to make money out of. It's not, not just another network marketing business. There's something behind this. So now I've got this spiritual journey that I've been on where I've been ministering to people. I've been helping them through their journeys, trying to help them through their journey of what I was trying to deal with. I have this experience of the Father, Heart of God, intimacy with Holy Spirit. Um, I've always known Jesus for who he is. Again, the revelation, beautiful revelation came a bit later. Um, but now all of a sudden I have essential oils and it's not 
God that healed me. It's the essential oils that have brought healing to me. So, of course, now all of a sudden we bring sort of conflict into the conversation. And the conflict is simply this. Why did God not heal me? And am I beginning to trust in, in material stuff to bring my healing? And I'm, am I taking my trust and my focus off God? You understand what I'm saying? Coming from ministry, these become real questions. Okay, because we're, we're trying to, to bring people on a spiritual journey. And all of a sudden now I'm shifting my spiritual journey to a natural journey. So I went on a personal, um, uh, personal road with God and had to bring some, some, some clarity to that, had to bring some, some peace to all of that journey. And that's where I'm going to jump into the journey of uh, doTERRA, not doTERRA, um, ultimately is doTERRA, but uh, essential oils in the Bible. And how I've been able to piece it together and not only just find peace in the journey, but actually find excitement and conviction that God has truly given us essential oils for the well-being of humanity. Um, it's, not even, it's not even an option for me to consider anything different. And hopefully by the time we're done, I've spent 24 minutes um, sharing my heart. Now I guess I better share some presentation. All right. But that brings us to the place of saying, people, we have such a beautiful thing in essential oils. We really, really do. Um, and hopefully by the time we're done the presentation and answered some questions, you'll be able to say, okay, this is good. This is, this is I have some comfort in knowing that God gave us this. And um, to give this away, to, firstly, to use it for myself is an incredible blessing. For me to give this away is such a privilege and such an honor to be able to give it away. Um, the biggest... No, I'm not going to go there. All right, for the sake of time. All right, so I'm going to share my screen with you, and I'm going to uh, do a presentation. It has been recorded. Again, I can share this presentation with you. You can modify it, change it, do whatever you want. Uh, nothing is copyrighted. It is copyrighted in heaven. Um, so where do we have? We got, uh, all right. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, so you're probably going to lose me. And I am going to, um, let's have a look. All right, no, we'll see, you can still see me. And I can see some of you, that's all cool. All right, are we good so far? Thumbs up, thumbs down, we're all good? Okay, excellent. You haven't fallen asleep, it's 8.30 at night uh, in South Africa for most of you, for some of you. All right. All right, the evidence of care, essential oils in the Bible. Um, I titled this the evidence of care because really I, I truly believe in my heart that this is what it is. And take everything that I've said as the foundation of where we're going to go with this, what it looks like in the Bible, and recognizing that this is an incredibly loving Father. It's the evidence of his care for us. All right. Question we have to ask ourselves, and hopefully many of you have already figured out the answer to this. Um, what are essential oils? Well, um, essential oils are natural aromatic compounds extracted from plants. We know that. Um, it's not rocket science. We're not going to go into the details of all of that. But really, from every part of the plant, different plants, essential oils can be, uh, different parts of different plants, essential oils can be extracted. Um, and we have found that, that essential oils can be 50 to 70 times more powerful, uh, more potent than the dry herbs. So many of us have cooked with dry herbs throughout our lives, all right? Um, I'm not a very good cook through this whole sort of social distancing, stay at home couple of three weeks. There, I've started making rusks, biltong, curries, um, I've actually started using recipes and what I've found in the recipes is that they ask for all of these herbs and spices. And I'm like, yeah, we know all the names. And as a, again, as a guy, like I don't know all the names. I know that they're there, but it's bringing such a reality into the herbs and spices that we use. Many of them have essential oils. A turmeric, for instance, a very, very powerful essential oil and a very powerful herb, but the essential oil is incredible. And as we're able to distill and extract the essential oil from the plants, um, we recognize that the human body interacts with them very, very well, and they're very potent, very powerful and beneficial to us. So those are essential oils. 
They, they've been used throughout history in both perfumes and medicines. You can go and do your, your homework on the internet and find out more about that. But we all know that the, the pharaohs were embalmed. And what were they embalmed with? Essential oils. That's all they had. They didn't have the chemical um, synthetic makeup chemicals that we have today. They didn't have the factories that we have today for those things. What they did have was the ability to distill and extract essential oils and use those as their medicines and use those as their perfumes. So we know for thousands of years, since the beginning of time, essential oils have been used. So where in the Bible do we find essential oils? Now, again, as I said, when I do a, when I do a, a, a live class, no, it's not a dead class. When I do it one in person with people, I say to them, you're old enough, you're big enough, you're wise enough, you can read your Bibles, go and figure it out. I don't want to spend a lot of time telling you where essential oils are in the Bible because you can find that out for yourself. But we are going to go through um, a few references, and one of them is um, at Jesus' birth. We know that gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There is a possibility that the gold could have been turmeric. Uh, turmeric is a gold color. So the first two were essential oils. There's no reason why the gold may not have been essential oils. But that's neither here nor there. We'll find out one way. When, one day when we talk to Jesus himself, it's like, hey, what were you really given? Uh, Nicodemus, he brings myrrh and aloe, which is sandalwood, to embalm Jesus' body after Jesus' death on the cross. Mary Magdalene washed Jesus' feet with spike knot. Now, what is that called? You figured it out, Michelle. When we were in, in South Africa, we figured that out. What was it in Afrikaans? Now you don't even remember. <laughs> Not this willing. Ah, thank you, Tarina. There you go. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. All right, for the South Africans. Because it seemed to be the question everywhere I went in South Africa that they would say, what's spike knot? What's spike knot? So now you will know. Okay, the psalmist who wrote the psalm in, in Psalm 45 talks about sandalwood, the scent of sandalwood and myrrh. All right, they're talking about these things, perfumes. They've been using a lot, so he writes about them. God gives Moses instruction on making anointing oil. Now remember, this is directly from God, and he's, the anointing oil uses cinnamon, calamus, and cassia, and he blended, with, blended it with olive oil. All right, so God says this. This is his instructions to say, use my creation. I want to, I want to give you an anointing oil. And I want to tell you what to do with it. So God's saying, use essential oil, people. Um, Isaiah mentions oh, the flyer of the field. No, he doesn't. The flowers of the field. Auto, autocorrect didn't autocorrect well there. All right. He mentions the, the, the flowers of the field, and that's understood to be, we don't know for certain, but it's understood to be robe and chamomile from what they can ascertain and um, discern from, from archaeology and all the things that they've, scr they've scratched together. Jesus addresses the Pharisees for the, in Luke 11 um, for the hypocrisy of, of the Phar their hypocrisy of tithing of mint and rue and all manner of herbs, but, but neglecting other things, all right? So he's, Jesus is saying, hey, listen, um, I'm not going to get into what he's saying with regard to the, the hypocrisy, what they were being hypocritical about, but he's saying, hey, you guys use all of these herbs, you use all of these things, and you tithe all of these things, all right? He's, he's acknowledging their use of herbs and spices. He's acknowledging their use, the value of these things that they have, and he's, and he's acknowledging it in them. It's important to recognize that Jesus does that. The centurion at the cross offered Jesus a sponge soaked in vinegar on a stick of hyssop. Now, hyssop is, is um, a very, very uh, therapeutic, has medicinal, medicinal values. So we have a sponge, we have vinegar, and we have hyssop. We know that particles um, and molecules can interact, leave, and join other molecules of other, um, of other substances, join them, no, interact with them and intermingle with them. Um, very quickly and very easily. Uh, so we've got the sponge, we've got uh, vinegar, and the, it's placed on a hyssop stick. And the hyssop has some uh, therapeutic value to it. So Jesus has presented this um, on the cross. All right. And then we have probably one which many of you uh, would, would suggest. If I said to you, what, what's one story of essential oils? You probably all go first to to or majority would go first to Jesus, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. All right. But a lot of people also go to Esther because this is a very, very common story and a popular story. 
Mester, uh, Mester. Esther used essential oils um, and it was given to all the people who went through the, the same process as Esther. Uh, six months they bathed in myrrh. All right, and then after the six months, then they used other anointing oils, other essential oils, other products and, and um, beautifying products and perfumes to beautify themselves. These are all essential oils that they have been using in the past. And mess, Esther used it before she pre presented herself to the king. All right, those are very common places that you're gonna see essential oils. And there's apparently there's about 600 references of essential oils and similar types of products, be they herbs, um, leaves that are, are used for, um, for for certain purposes uh, throughout the Bible. So there's a, a lot of them. And I encourage you, if you want to, if it interests you, to go ahead and um, learn more about that and find out more about that. I'm not really interested in that side of it. I'm interested in this side of it. Where else in the Bible do we find essential oils? And I'm going to shift direction very slightly here. Um, um, 834, okay. Not 834, but yeah. Where else in the Bible do we find essential oils? All right. This is what I love. Let's go back to the very beginning, and it's going to tie in to everything I've said um, in the beginning. Let's return to the beginning in Genesis. Genesis 2, verse 7 to 9. What we see here is the construction of man's body and the awakening of man's soul. All right. And the Lord God planted, uh, he formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, immediately what we're seeing here is that God created, uh, let me just go to this, uh, let's have a look. I'm trying to get my speaker's notes. Um, there we go. Okay. In the process of, of creation, what we discover is God forming the earth he's forming he's formed the sphere he separates the water from the earth from the from the dry ground he places all these animals but when he starts placing anything that has life in it he 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 makes it out of the dust of the ground so um the birds of the air were formed out of the dust of the ground the beasts of the field were formed out of the dust of the ground the the um the plants were formed out of the dust of the ground. Everything that was made was formed out of the sphere, out of the dust of the ground. And so we read that through the, through the passage of scripture. Um, and that's important for us to, to keep in mind that everything that we see today, God made to be um, existent and have life from the ground that we're in, that, that we're standing on, all right? And that, was all, that all happened before Adam and Eve were, were created. Day one, two, three, four, five, and six, Adam and Eve were created on day six. But before they were created, the whole world, the whole earth was set up to be successful without human beings. God had blessed everything, said this is absolutely fantastic, and he had blessed everything to multiply after its own kind. So put that into perspective. The ground is, is, is barren, and all of a sudden up come these plants, and these animals are made, and everything will function on its own in the garden without the intervention of man. Now, it won't expand and it won't continue outside of the garden, which God wanted us to do. So he puts man in the garden to, to tend and take care of and to, to multiply in, in that sense. But remember, before man was um, put on, in, on the earth, um, everything functioned as God had said it should function, and it all came out of the dust of the ground. Um, Simple question, based upon your theology, your ideology of, of creation, of the beginning of time, was God's intent for this to break down and fall apart? The truth is no. What God didn't, didn't make anything with the intention of it becoming destru destroyed. He didn't make that. He, in, in his love, he gave options because that's what love does. It gives free will. But... 
his intent was never for this to become to, to be destroyed. Therefore, everything on the planet was designed and created to live for eternity in health, in well-being, because there was no brokenness. Okay. So um, everything that God created was intended to be sustained by the earth. Um, where are we? Okay. Verse 15. So jump a few verses. And the verse 15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord, com uh, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you shall eat it you will surely die. Everything that was created. So then God creates this, everything. Man's not in there. He comes down, God comes down, and out of the dust of the ground, he shapes and he forms our form and our shape that we have today, our hands, our feet, everything that is in us, he forms it and he, he creates it. And then Adam, as Adam, the first human, the first being, um, is lying on the ground in this form, in this shape, and God comes down in that place of intimacy. He puts his mouth, and I'm not saying this is what happened, but when we know today that to, to bring somebody back to life, we give them mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. What we're doing is we're breathing our life, our breath back into them so that they can come alive. I can only imagine that God comes down in this place of intimacy and his excitement. He sees this form laying on the, on the, on the, in the dirt that he's created in his image and his likeness. And now he says, I'm going to put my life into this. I'm going to put my breath into this and the excitement he must have had. This is, wasn't just process. Remember, he was at this point giving birth to his children. We are his sons and daughters. And it's incredibly beautiful, the emotion that comes into this, where God comes down and he breathes his life into this, this, um, this body that's lying there and it comes alive. Now, where is that body manufactured from? Where was it constru constructed from? It was constructed from the very same place that the trees of the field were constructed. The very same place that every other form of life on the planet was constructed. Okay, it's important to recognize this and it's important to know this because this is how deeply loved and cared for we are. That we're the only part of creation that had the breath of our Father in us. We're the only part of creation that he, he loves all creation, but he fell in love with enough to, to send his only begotten son to, to set us free, to bring us back into fullness of restoration of who he is. And that's incredibly beautiful. So he, he, creates, um, he creates man from the same place that he created everything else. And then he says to man, be fruitful, multiply fill the earth subdue it but everything that i've given to you is good for you to be sustained for how long for eternity it was never god's intent for us to die and so he puts us in a place that will sustain us and we still live on the earth we still live in the place where he put us that is meant to sustain us one of the beautiful things we're learning about um, the human brain is that it has the ability to believe certain things and manifest those things um, and to change and recreate its environment around it. It's, it's what we do all the time on a micro level, but on a, on a, ma a macro level, on a bigger scale, we have that ability because we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of our father. We have the mind of our, our, our creator. And as we become more intimate with him, as we spend time with Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of God, knowing his nature, knowing his heart, as we begin to think on those things, what we do, we dwell on those things, they become the nature of our mind and our thinking. And as it becomes the nature of our mind and our thinking, so we recreate and, and, and the atmosphere and the world around us, and we change it to be more and more like what he created in the Garden of Eden. Um, it's the kingdom of God. Jesus prayed the kingdom of God. Let it come on earth as it is in heaven. He took, commanded us to pray those things. We need to be thinking the same way as he, he was thinking. We need to be um, under the conviction and, and the truth that what he made in the garden of the Eden of Eden was incredibly beautiful and designed for us to live eternally. And so he puts us there in the garden of Eden and he says, go take dominion of it all. 
But in so doing, I have to ask the question, in what ways did Adam and Eve interact? And this, sometimes some of the bells may start going off. In what ways um, did Adam and Eve interact with creation? There are three primary ways that we interact with our creation around us. Now I'm going to use this as an example. Um, Nicolene, you've just picked up your water bottle. So your first point of interaction with creation around you is what? Physical contact. All right. It's touch. It's, it's, we've just touched something. That's, in, that, that's, that's a point of interaction with creation. There's a second way. Well, I, I'm jumping ahead. What are the ways that Adam and Eve um, interacted with their... So topically, that's exactly what you've done. You've touched your bottle. Some of you have picked up. Somebody's on there. Okay. Some of you have um, are writing notes with your pen and you're holding your paper. Some of you, yeah, we're all sitting on a chair. We're touching something. That's a primary way of interacting with, interacting with creation around us. The second way is aromatic. All right. Um, you've got essential oils, you put on perfume. If you just take the sleeve of your fabric, you can smell there's a, there's a certain um, aromatic uh, property to the fabric, to the paint that you have in your house. We, we, we interact with um, creation, our environment, our atmosphere. We interact with that aromatically all the time. And we're always breathing in air and molecules of something. So we interact with the second way. And the third way is internally. Um, we all eat. We're all using these principles that God created in the Garden of Eden all the time. All right. The question is, what are we using them on and what are we putting into our systems and into our bodies? So let's back up a little bit. The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, oh, Adam's created and God says this is not good for him to be alone. He needs a bit of trouble in his life, so I better make him a wife. That's not what he said. Okay. <laughs> what he said was, it's not good for man to be alone. He needs some help because he can't do it alone. So he puts Adam to sleep, and from Adam, he, he creates Eve. Now here, I just, I look at this picture, and this is not biblical, this is me, but it could be anything. I mean, it, to me, it's the fullness of, of the expression of the father, and he looks down, Adam wakes up, and he sees this woman, he's like, this is fantastic. She wakes up, and she's like, this is incredible. I have an amazing relationship, but she's walking through the garden with him, and she turns, and because men don't see these things, women do, she turns and she sees these beautiful flowers that are growing out of the field. And she looks at them, and the wind blows the, the aroma and the fragrance of the petals, of the pollen, of the flower. And she says, Adam, this is incredibly beautiful. And all of a sudden, aromatically, she's interacting with creation. Now, what science has proven and told us is that when we breathe things into our, into our noses, into our lungs, it goes up into our limbic systems, what does it do for us? It affects the bodily systems and the bodily functions. So all of a sudden, Eve and Adam have woken up from their slumber. They've come alive, and they're starting to breathe in the nutrition and the goodness that the Father has provided for their eternal sustaining. They're, they don't even know they're doing it. But God has created in such a way that he said, these molecules are going to help your body function in this particular way. So he's created the sense of smell and, that, and the ability for the body to absorb into its system, into its bodily functions, whatever's coming through, aromatically coming through the air from, from these beautiful plants. Incredibly beautiful how he, he's created us. And so... Adam then, he, he, he gets this great idea. He says, my wife loves these flowers. So he runs the next morning and he goes and he picks a whole bunch of flowers. And all of a sudden what he's feeling and what he's experiencing is as he picks the flowers, the elements, the molecules from the flowers, the, the, the essential oils are now going in through the skin of his hands. And as he ran there, he didn't put on his shoes because he didn't have shoes. So he's running on the ground and all the elements are going through his feet. And science has taught us that the, the, um, the pores on the feet, on our feet and on our hands and our face are the three places on the body where you have the biggest, the largest pores. And so you put things on your feet and what happens? It goes up into your bodily system. So, so he runs along <clears throat> and he's stepping on the frankincense and he's stepping on the geranium and he's stepping on the, on the, on the, the, the mint leaves. And what's happening? 
all those molecules, all those essential oils are coming up through his body and they're sustaining his body. And so he takes these plants and he takes them, the flowers and he makes a beautiful arrangement and he's having all this, this interaction with God's creation. His body is coming alive because of this interaction. And he takes these flowers and he gives them to Eve and she's just so excited and happy. And they go off and they find a tree and the figs on the tree are just incredibly beautiful. So they take them and they begin to eat them. And we know we do it all the time. We eat food. Why? Because we need to be sustained. We want that food to sustain us and for our, the cells, the functioning of every cell in our body to be good and healthy and, and um, the way God created it to be. So in the Garden of Eden, without even knowing it, what we've gone back to is we've had to have science try and prove it to us, but they didn't. They were like children. They just lived in the perfect environment where automatically, topically, and internally, everything that God created for them was being absorbed into their systems. Um, is that? Okay, so we know, I'm not even gonna go there. Um, I've sort of jumped ahead. All right. Then God says, I'm just gonna do, really slow um, come on point number four all right they left the garden of eden i don't know what's up with the with the slides they left the garden of eden we know that they they disobeyed god they fell from from that place of um perfection and we don't blame them we probably would have done the same thing because in perfect love we're given free choice and so they made a wrong decision and God said, hey, if you eat of that tree, if you eat the fruit of this particular tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Um, we won't go into the theology behind that. It's just a beautiful story again of the goodness of God. But they have to be removed from the garden. And what begins to happen is that the human body begins to die and age because it can no longer interact with creation in the three forms that God created for that for the body to interact with it so that it could live and in health eternally. Does it, does it make sense what I'm saying? Is it, are you following all of this? Please put some chats. It's like, this doesn't make sense, Darren. Adam and Eve have been put into this beautiful environment where their bodies are sustained eternally through the three forms of interaction. All of a sudden they're outside of the garden where they can no longer have that and the bodily functions begin to shut down and humans begin to die. And now we have the age limit of 120 years or so it says in the Bible that it'll be. All right. So it's not rocket science to know that essential oils are through the Bible. They're throughout the heart of the Father, They're throughout the heart of God, that God, when he looked down in the, in the process of creation, says, I'm going to put my children, I will be a father to them. They will be my children. I will put them in the place of absolute beauty and absolute perfection for their, their bodily functions to be healthy and live eternally. This is a loving father. This is the loving father that just makes sense to me as I, as I contemplate and I consider essential oils in the use of my life, in the use of um, treating ailments and, uh, and things that my body needs. This is what God made for me in the Garden of Eden. Why would I not trust him? Why would I not go to the things that he created? Why would I want to run off to a doctor and say, no, I don't trust God's stuff that he made. I want to trust what the pharmaceutical companies have made. Why would I do that? Maybe because this is where my faith is. And that's okay. It doesn't matter wherever you're at. But I, my hope is that through this process of discussing and talking about the nature of God and, and the Father heart of God and intimacy with Holy Spirit, and then bringing it back into creation that he made to sustain us, hopefully what it does for us is says, hey, hold on, God, you're so much more than I could ever dream or imagine. And this just makes sense to me that you actually have provided for me the things that I need for my health, things that my family needs for their health. And so what are those things that I need? What are those things that I need for my specific need? All right. So that's, the, that's creation. I love that. I really do. It's so demonstrative of the Father heart of God of intimacy. Um, and Jesus has brought us back through what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. He has brought us back to the place of being sons and daughters of God. Now we get to think like sons and daughters of God. We get to think like sons, not slaves. We get, we get to say, God, you know what? Um, you, you made that for me and you made me for that. 
and I get to I get to enter into that as much as I personally want to. And so we've gone full on into that. I love the journey. It's become part of our ministry to be able to help people and see them um, healed. Yes, we pray for people and absolutely we need miracles. And in this coming season, we're gonna see a load of miracles, just so you know. There are gonna be so many miracles out there, but it's still important for us to, to provide our bodies with good nutrition. It's vital for us to do that. We can't say, God, I want a miracle and still eat McDonald's all day. It doesn't work like that. God wants us to be sons and daughters. And he wants us to take what he's created, consume it, use it, and allow our bodies to respond to that. But then let's look at the end, because that's the very beginning of the Bible. I've shared um, some of the stages throughout the Bible, some of the points throughout the Bible where people have used essential oils. But let's look at the end as well. The completion of perfect restoration. Um, this is where it's going. And the intent and the heart of God, what started in the Garden of Eden, is still available for us today and will be available in the new creation. Revelation 22. Um, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Come on, peeps. No longer will there be any curse. Yes, we trust God to heal. But he, in his love and his kindness, he's given us creation. In his goodness, he's looked down and he said, I want to put my children in a place that's going to sustain them. Essential oils isn't just a business. Like I can say to people, you need to eat organic food and this is where you can go and get your organic food and they'll have to pay for it. Because life runs that way. Essential oils is a ministry. It's the ability for me to say, God, I've got something that you gave me that I can help other people with. Why would I not do that? I'll go and pray for them. I'll care for them. I just, you know, one of the beautiful things that's happening in this season through this lockdown, that's really causing us to, to um, reevaluate what's important in life. And I think what we're finding is that there's very little important in life other than a relationship with God through Jesus and helping other people and caring for other people. And as I've contemplated this, Daph and I have moved on from um, pastoring, as I mentioned earlier, pastoring full-time church into um into a full probably more a full-time holistic ministry and I, I say that respectfully and and carefully because the word holistic has got a, a bad reputation it's got a bad name but it's unfortunately been abused and used but holistic means every part of me has a ministry to somebody else and one of the things that i absolutely love and i see starting to come out of this is us being able to say yes there's a lot of sick people but with what god has given us we're able to see healing coming into people's lives. We're able to minister to people, not just to, you know, in the, in the, in the um, church ministry. And I speak from every pastor's perspective. Yes, we've seen some beautiful things, but I've probably seen more people not healed than people heal. And, and in the past, I used to pray for people and then, and then walk away and say, God, I hope you do that because if you don't, I have nothing to offer. I have nothing else to give. And there's a measure of raising hope and then dropping hope and then raising hope and dropping hope. And now I have something to say. I know God gave me the supernatural ability to pray for people, but he's also given me this beautiful natural ability to heal people through what he's created and provided. And for me, it's a holistic approach to loving and caring for people. So um, my encouragement to you is, is go on this journey of discovery of of. What's in your heart with regard to essential oils? Why did you even want to learn about essential oils? Why did you want to even come to a class of essential oils in the Bible? Were you wanting to be convinced that they're okay? Um, and all of these answers, all the answers that you could give are okay. They're true. They're right. They're real for you. For me, it was about, it had to work for me and lines up with my theology. I can, I can minister to people all day 
and give them essential oils. I have no guilt about that whatsoever. I still struggle taking people, people's money because that's a weakness that I have. I'd rather give my life away and give everything away. The problem with that theory is that once I've given it all away, I've got nothing left to give. And so God's okay with money. He truly is. He's okay with people paying for a service and a product. He's okay with that. Um, not that that's our motivation. Our motivation is to care for and love and help people. Um, yeah. It's, it's been an hour. It's 12.58. Um, I could do an altar call right now. With... <laughs> There's a question that they asked that I think you need to answer. Okay, go for it. <laughs> What's the question? Let's have a look here. Which one? There's been a whack out of them. Is how did the people use the oils in the Bible? Did they actually use the product or the oils that they made the oils? How do you think? Uh, that's that question is actually relevant. From a, um, uh, from a practical side of it, I don't know. What we do know is they had the ability to build an ark. Okay, so they had a lot of technology. They had a lot of wisdom. They had a lot of skills, a lot of talents in those days. They were not backward people. So my personal view, it's, it's irrelevant to the, to the grand scheme of, of are there, is it legit or not, but I would suggest that they had the ability to distill just like we do. Because the distillation process is actually fairly simple. Um, to be able to extract essential oils from plants is fairly, fairly simple. And if they were able to build an ark to withstand um, what it needed to withstand, I'm sure that distilling essential oils was, was no issue for them whatsoever. However, we do know that they used a lot of the herbs and spices. We know that for a fact, the dried herbs and spices. Um, do you think that because we're becoming smarter, you know, as, as we age, do you think that they, like, when they brought Jesus the frankincense and myrrh, were they bringing, like, the actual frankincense? Or do you think that um, they did distill it into oil? Is, like, you were saying that it's 70 or 50 to 60 times more potent than the yeah. actual stuff. So do you think as we get older, we're actually understanding, oh, we can compress it into the oil and this is smarter and more beneficial for us? Um, I, I have no idea. I think, um, I don't know how the wise men got their, got their, uh, their wealth. All right. But it could quite easily have been, and obviously I'm speculating about all of this. It could quite easily have been that they actually had essential oil companies. There's no reason because they brought essential oils with them they had the ability to to trade and purchase essential oils but at the same time um they may have just have had the, the frankincense resin i don't know i would suggest not simply be, be because what would jesus mother have done what would mary have done with the resin like how do you use i don't know how to use frankincense resin it's really not good for anything else but making frankincense oil um there you go yeah that's the frankincense resin that's a piece of it. So like, what would you do with that if you brought that to baby Jesus? <laughs> like, exactly. I'm assuming that they would have a way to, to get it into a form that they would be able to use it. That, so that's why I tend to think that the, the wise men already took the oil with them. Because Mary and Joseph were not equipped to, to distill, break that down. Uh, that I know of. That I don't know. Do you just boil it? Do you just... I don't know. There's a lot that I don't know. Um, what I do know is it's it's through our creation but in one form or another. And the fact that we have it in, in this form that we have today is incredibly beautiful and we're very privileged to to have that. And I think it's a beautiful time in history because we're seeing so much, so many beautiful advances that we can take advantage of. Let's use this one as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, the plants in the beginning, they were pure and not polluted um, like our atmosphere is today. Let me, let me just address that quickly. Um, I 100% agree with you. I think the, the potency, um, 
I got so many calls going on right now. I don't know if it's people trying to ask questions on my phone. Um, the potency is, is really a great uh, conversation because I would suggest that what we had in, in the Garden of Eden, yes, we know that it was completely unadulterated um, and it was, it was pure and perfect. So it must have been incredibly potent. Um, okay. Uh, somebody's desperately trying to get a hold of me. Sorry, and it's all the way from South Africa as well. So I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, I'll, I'll call them back. Um, it's it's vital uh, in my view. So Daphne and I started with another essential oils company, and I don't know where you guys are at with what essential co oil companies that you're with. I I'm imagining that you're more connected to DoTerra, um, and it doesn't really matter. But this is an important question because. If I'm going to put something in my body that's that's uh, designed and intended for my body to benefit by it, and I have a choice between um, two options, would I choose the one that is pure or would I choose the one that is adulterated? And I think we would all answer the question and say, well, I want the pure one. What I know about essential oils, about what we have available for us today, is that there are three companies in the world that produce pure essential oils. And that would be doTERRA and there's another two companies. doTERRA is the only company in the world that will certify the purity of the essential oils. Now, they don't certify organic. They certify purity because purity goes beyond organic. You can buy essential oils in any, pretty much any store nowadays. Um, supermarkets. Uh, in fact, I found them in, in um, a building store in, in Mossel Bay. I found some essential oils in Baldi's Store Muscle Bay. So um, you can buy essential oils anywhere. They're very easy to come by. The question is, what's in them? And I'm not going to spend time going through why I truly believe doTERRA's are not just because they say it. I've done my own research on the side and discovered the reason why um, essential oils are so cheap. And it's simply because they are not pure. All right, there are other things added to them in order to dilute them. And this is scientifically proven. Um, and this is economically proven as well. And, and exterior from doTERRA, it's been done by another company. Um, I'm not even sure if doTERRA is connected at all with that other company because I've done my research on my own. Discovered that the only reason that essential oils are cheap is because they've been undiluted. But essential oils that are not cheap, um, now I can't say that, that all essential oils that are not cheap are undiluted. What I can say is doTERRA's essential oils are certified pure and they're not as cheap as the cheap ones. But they're the only company in the world that'll certify the purity. So yes, um, Garden of Eden had absolutely pure essential oils I, or, or plants. There was none of that uh, pollution, adulteration, absolutely. But in today's world, it's essential for me to ensure that I can get the purest grade possible to treat what I need to treat. It's a, it's a beautiful journey. I love doTERRA essential oils. Again, I said there's three companies. The, the other two companies you won't know, um, and they're so small that you'll never get the essential oils anyway, because a 15 mil frankincense, this is slim and sassy, but a 15 mil frankincense is about three times the price of doTERRA's 15 mil frankincense. They're the same quality, but three times the price. So why would we, why would we do that? And they're very, very small companies. So I'm not saying doTERRA is the only company that has pure essential oils. What I'm saying is they're the company that will give you the, the, the peace of mind that you're using a pure product and at the best possible price. Um, yep, holistic start in the Garden of Eden. Any other questions? Michelle, did you see any other questions um, that need to be addressed? Anyone got... No, thank you. It, I just wanted to thank you for hosting this class for us. It was amazing. You really are. Um, I'm going to finish this class. Class. Here I go with my funny accents. So getting my this class. Um, I'm going to finish this class uh, with just a word of encouragement. All right. Um, I spoke about the Father Heart of God incredibly beautiful it truly is it's, it's revolutionized my life in the way that i i interact um with god himself and it's just it's, it's changed how i interact with my, my kids my family it's just really beautiful 
Intimacy with Holy Spirit, learning to hear the voice of God is one of the most uh, powerful things that we can do as his children. Um, to learn to hear the voice of God and to know how he speaks intimately to us and why he would want to speak to us. Jesus himself said, my sheep hear me and they know my voice. I'll say that again. Jesus said this himself. His words were, my sheep hear me, they know my voice. God wants to talk to us for ourselves individually. He wants to encourage us. He wants to build us up. He wants us to love and care for other people. And one of the ways that we, we carry those things which are from the Father to the lost world and the broken world and the people that we need to minister to is as we hear the voice of Holy Spirit and he says to us, I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to do that. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, a couple of years ago, I love, I mean, I got a million stories and this is the one that just comes to mind because I love living in this territory. This is the one that came to mind. So this is the one I'm responding to and telling you. Um, I was sitting in my home here and I felt Holy Spirit said to me, get up, get on your motorcycle and go to the coffee shop. And he pointed out a coffee shop and he said, there'll be an elderly gentleman sitting at a table alone. And I want you to go and sit with him and I want you to go and talk with him. And I'm like, okay, here we go. So when we start, when we start this journey of intimacy with Holy Spirit, sometimes it, become, it becomes nerve wracking. Sometimes it's like, this is weird. Why would I do that? Um, this is crazy. So I got on my motorcycle and I've been doing this for long enough to know that, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong, just be obedient. And so I got on my bike, I went there and there was nobody there. Um, so I sat down in the coffee shop and I said, okay, God, well, you told me to come here. So I'm here. A couple of minutes later, an elderly gentleman walked in and he sat at the table on his own. And I'm like, well, that's it. So I got up and I went and chatted with him, spoke with him. The journey was not about how I ministered to them. The journey was how I obeyed Holy Spirit's voice. When we live in this place, we'll begin to see incredible things happen among us, around us, with our friends, with our family. Somebody says to you, and this is just an example, I'm not pushing doTERRA, but somebody says, the Holy Spirit says to you, you have what this person needs in a form of an oil that I want to bring healing to that person. We need to get out there and give it to them. Okay, I, beautiful testimony, beautiful story. Um, I'm not going to, yeah, whatever. A million stories. Okay, so that's the second thing. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely key and absolutely vital. We can do a whole class, if, you, if any of you want, we can do a whole class on hearing the voice of God. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit. How do I know it's His voice? Um, I, I love all this stuff, okay? Because to me, this is what it's all about. Jesus said, my spirit will be with you. He will lead you, guide you, and teach you in all things. All right? He will do it. We're moving into a season, folks, where the pastor, the preacher, is not going to be able to do it for us anymore. All right? We have to be there for ourselves, for our families, for our kids. Yes, we need each other. We don't forsake the gathering of the saints. We absolutely don't do that. But we need this for us. You need this for you. You need intimacy with the Holy Spirit, with the Father for you, for your husbands, for your children. You need it. And it's a beautiful place to be. All right. But the third thing, and I want to leave you with this, Jesus and the finished work of the cross of Jesus is beyond what we could ever dream or imagine. Anything that you have ever been through, and this is my journey of freedom, anything that you have ever been through, anything that you have ever done, anything that you have ever felt guilty of or shameful of was paid for on the cross before you even did it. It was forgiven before you even did it. And the only thing that is held against you is what you hold against you. Because Jesus doesn't hold anything against you. He doesn't see anything that you think that you've done. You are a new creation. Somebody says to me, well, Darren, um, what about the things that, that, that you know, I st I'm still going to sin and I'm, and I'm still going to do all these things. Well, you're not because you're born again. And they said, well, I do all these bad things. And I said, well, are you born again? And they said, yes. I said, well, are you born again into a corruptible seed again? No, an incorruptible seed. Well, therefore, you are no longer a sinner. And I know this may confound some of you. And I know this may throw a whack load of questions out about because the things that you think or the struggles that you think or the behaviors that you see around you. 
That's why Jesus came. He came because of those things, because we couldn't fix those things. And he came to forgive us of those things. Now he simply says, listen, I know my dad's on the call. And, and I use this example, this demonstration a lot. I now, the older I get, the more I realize that I do things that my dad always did. Why is that? It's because I've spent time with him. I grew up with him. I watched him. I looked at him. I listened to him. And now my life is manifesting what my father did. And when we spend time in intimacy in the freedom of Christ, we, we forget about holding things against ourselves. We are a brand new creation. When we spend time in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, what we begin to find is we manifest the Father's heart. And we start to unmanifest those things that we've always held against us, those things that the sins, the bad things, the things that we think are also bad that Jesus himself died for. Let's stop all that focus. Let's focus on intimacy. Let's focus on the Father and begin to manifest who he is. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I, I don't know where you're at. I just want to, I just want to pray. Um, this is an oils in the Bible class, but this is a Holy Spirit moment. And um, I bless each one of you in your intimacy with the Father to know him for who he truly is and to know him deeply. Father, I, I, I do. I, I'm so blessed and so grateful for what you've given, for who you are. You gave Jesus, because you gave Jesus, you accept me just as I am. I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for that. And for all of us that you see us now as sons and daughters, pure, spotless, without blemish, completely forgiven. The Holy Spirit, I, I thank you that you never leave us. You've never forsaken us. And even though some of us don't know how to hear your voice, some of us are still struggling with a lot of stuff. You're still there and you still want to talk to us. And so I bless each one of you in Jesus' name to find that place of rest. And, and I speak the presence of Holy Spirit. And I ask Holy Spirit that you would be released in their hearts. And they open the ears of their hearts, open the eyes of their hearts, that they will see you. They will hear you. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. And let it be abundant, super abundant. Let it just manifest right where everyone is right now in their homes, in this season, in this time. Your goodness, your comfort, your friendship. And Jesus, I, yeah, we all owe such an incredible gratitude to you. And we do. We say thank you that you have forgiven us for everything that we've ever done and everything we will ever do, it's already been paid for. The lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth was slain for the fullness of time. Thank you, Jesus. And I bless each one of you in Jesus' name to begin to look at the Father's heart and the things that he's given you and enjoy the journey of the fruit of the things that he's given you for your health. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Darren. Bless you all abundantly. I'm pushing stop.